I'm Father Mitch Pacwa, and welcome to Scripture and Tradition. Today, we want to answer your questions. Well, maybe not all of your questions, but at least as many as we can in an hour-long show. We appreciate the email questions you send us to, by writing to Scripture and Tradition at EWTN.com, and we try to answer as many as we can every week. So we can't get to them, <laughs> just too many, plus the live questions. So today we're devoting a whole show just to your email questions because we know you want to get answers. So let's get started. And remember, you can still send your questions and comments uh, by, by email, writing to scriptureandtradition at ewtn.com. So we have... Uh, a, a few emails that uh, concern some of the issues brought up in Pope Francis' recent trip over to East Asia, Southeast Asia. Um, <clears throat> the first one is recently in Singapore, Pope Francis told an ecumenical group of young people that all religions are a way to reach God. This clearly contradicts Scripture and Vatican II's Lumen Gentium, which states, the church is necessary for salvation, as well as the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith's 2000 document, Dominus Jesus, which says, it is clear that it would be contrary to the faith to consider the church as one way of salvation alongside those constituted by other religions, seen as complementary to the church or substantially equivalent to her. And um, this uh, is the, the actual statement of uh, the Pope. Let me read that and then we'll try to respond. Uh, this is from his um, uh, speech. Now, he, he says uh, one of the things that impressed him about this group of young people was their interfaith dialogue. Uh, this is very important because if you start arguing my religion is more important than yours or mine is the true one, yours is not true, where does this lead? And somebody answers, say, a young person answered out destruction. That's what they responded. And he said, that is correct. All religions are paths to God. I will use an analogy. They are like different languages that express the divine, but God is for everyone, and therefore we are all God's children. But my God is more important than yours. Is this true? Well, there's only one God, and religions are like languages, paths to reach God. Some Sikh, some Muslims, some Hindus, some Christian. understood? Yet interfaith dialogue among young people takes courage, and the age of youth is an age of courage. So, uh, and he wants them to have the courage for uh, serious dialogue. Now, I, uh, this is a conversation that he had, obviously, and um, I wish that he had uh, more of his own dialogue between what he said here and what Lumen Gentium says, the Vatican II document and scripture that, um, you know, our Lord Jesus talks very clearly that no one comes to me except through the Father. And this dialogue between uh, our already given doctrine and what he is saying here in regard to the conversation, the, the, the religious, interreligious dialogue, 
uh, should themselves be positions in dialogue. And I, I don't see that here. Um, what he's trying to do is encourage the, uh, the people in Singapore. Singapore is a very religiously diverse country. Uh, it's a basically a city-state. Uh, the whole island of Singapore is one very beautiful city. Um, uh, a lot of sea traffic. It's enormous. Back during World War II, it was described as the sewer of Asia. Not anymore. It's turned into quite a uh, wealthy and quite a beautiful place. Um, but there are people from religions all over the world who live there, including many Catholics. They have an archbishop there uh, that presides over that uh, church. And they are next to, well, in between uh, different parts of Malaysia, which itself is a Muslim country. Um, those, for instance, not too far away is Borneo, where there are many indigenous religions still, with a large growing Catholic population. So the dialogue among religions is important. And it is correct to say that we should have that dialogue. And as he goes on in the next para paragraph, says one thing that helps a lot with dialogue is respect. And we should have respect for the conscience of various people from different religions. But we also have to recognize the claims of Jesus Christ and what that means. So can, is it possible to dialogue with people of other religions while you know, not putting uh, or, or making it seem, I don't think he means something different than what the Vatican Council said or Scripture says. I don't think he means that at all. But is it possible to make this statement in a way that maintains the church's standard teaching that uh, Catholicism is the uh, way to um, you know, the, the the way to salvation, and that it is unique, and it is the way that Christ established, and that Christ is also a unique and distinctive way to God that, again, he says nobody can come to the Father except through him. But that doesn't mean that people are seeking God, and in certain ways uh, the church has always understood that people outside of the accepted community were always seeking God. For instance, uh, when you take a look at the book of Numbers, there's a pagan prophet named, uh, usually in English they pronounce it Balaam, uh, Balaam in, in Hebrew and Canaanite. Um, he was, he's a known character, not only in the Bible, but outside the Bible he's known, uh, 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 steely describing him. But even though he was a pagan, the Lord used him as a prophet of God. And we can see somebody like Job. Job is not Jewish. He was not part of the people of Israel. That's why when he speaks, he speaks about God, uh, Eloah, or uh, El Shaddai, God Almighty. Uh, he doesn't usually use the divine name because he's not part of Israel, and yet he was truly seeking God. There are people outside of the community of Christian faith who truly and honorably and honestly seek the truth about God. So that's a reality, and the Pope is correct about that, obviously. And he's trying to encourage that dialogue because these young people are seeking a way to coexist 
in this very diverse culture in Singapore and uh, have serious dialogue, not just exist side by side and leave each other alone, but engage in a respectful dialogue. So encouraging that is right. That's exactly right. But at the same time, you know, there's this other element about the claims each of those religions makes. Islam uh, claims to be the, the one way. For instance, Muhammad is called uh, the Hatam al-Nabi'in, the seal of the prophets. He's the last prophet, and he supersedes all previous prophets, according to Islam. We have to engage with that claim, and with our, as well as with our claim, but to do so in a way that is respectful. And, you know, um, yes, these are different languages of addressing the one God, um, though not all people believe that there is only one God. There are many people, I suspect, in that dialogue who believe in multiple deities. And that would also be a different, more than just a different language, uh, different addressees as well as a different language. So this is something that, again, I would like to see in such statements more of a dialogue with our own position and at the, an honest recognition of it and what our claims are and at the same time a respectful entrance into dialogue to understand what others believe and teach and discuss why we hold what we hold, why they hold what they hold and to do so with mutual respect. That would be correct, I think a little more nuanced, and that's what I think I would be looking for in this case. There's another uh, question from Francis who writes, Father Paco, I'm confused. Can the church or the Pope suddenly declare that something is a sin or that something long considered a sin is not a sin? I read that Pope Francis said, not welcoming migrants is a sin. I've never heard that before, Francis. Um, Francis, I'm sure that he is making reference back to Matthew 25. Remember that uh, passage there, that when our Lord said, uh, when I was a stranger, you welcomed me. But then, there is another group designated as the goats, and the goats um, also uh, are addressed by Jesus and said, when I was a stranger, you did not welcome me. And because of that, along with failing to feed the hungry and give water to the thirsty and clothes to the naked, visit the sick and, and the imprisoned, in addition to those corporal, the, the failure to do those corporal works of mercy, the work of the corporal work of mercy of welcoming the stranger was neglected. And for that, they went to hell. Now, that's not the Pope saying something new. That is something that is in Matthew 25. And we have to take that very seriously. Um, and this is something that we, um, you know, have to address. And I, I want to go on on this topic with another email that is related to it. Uh, this is from Bruce in Laredo, Texas. Um, Father Paqua, during the Pope's trip to Asia, he called the rejection of illegal immigrants a grave mortal sin and equivocated it with the sin of abortion. How far does our Christian obligation to welcome the stranger really go? Well, there are a number of things here that we have to keep very much in mind. Um, again, the, the same point in Matthew 25, neglecting to welcome the stranger is a, a sin 
that sends the goats to hell. So that's one concern. The other issue, though, is, in, uh, and this gets at your question, how far, to, uh, to what uh, extent do we welcome them? Um, we welcome them as wholeheartedly as we can. But most, I think, not all, but uh, so many of us Americans are now paying attention to uh, the fact that over the last uh, few years, we've seen between nine, at least nine, that's the official figure, uh, but perhaps as high as 20 million people having come in. That's the high point that some people say, uh, but the government says about nine million people. And the difficulty is that as we hear again and again from cities that were designated themselves uh, as sanctuary cities, that they are now overwhelmed by the number of people who have come in. And this has led to a couple of different, uh, at least a few different sets of problems. One, the cities that are and states that are receiving this sudden influx of millions of immigrants are not prepared for it. They had not been given time and resources to prepare before folks came. And so there is a serious housing shortage and there are strains on the health and education and welfare systems that this is a very serious problem in places like Boston, New York, Chicago, and the other large cities. And it means that a number of people are put at another kind of risk by having to live on the street or be subject to you know, harassment by gangs, which is, we'll get to that problem in a minute. A second issue is that the hustle to uh, uh, allocate money in a hurry and housing in a hurry for this sudden influx of immigrants has also meant that many of our own poor in this country are being neglected, that they were dependent on a number of government institutions, and the funds and resources are now strained. So, for instance, in cities across the country, the uh, food banks and other resources are very strained, as well as uh, places for housing. And so now s schools get closed so they can be used for housing. Recreation centers like up in Boston get closed so in, in the inner city so that they can be used for housing. And a number of other emergency situations. And it's not clear how that is going to be uh, addressed. The third problem has been that there is a lack of clarification about the people coming in. People are coming in from all over the world, not just from Latin America by any means. And we, the, the federal government, including the FBI, has mentioned that there is a large uptick in people who are wanted on terrorist lists. There's a, need, a much, much larger uptick in gangs. Uh, apparently, some countries are releasing inmates from prison and letting them go, and they come here. And 
they're fighting our gangs <laughs> and taking control of the old gangs and causing other kinds of harassment because a good number of these people come from very, very weakened families. And as a result, they tend towards sociopathic behavior. The amount of violence against other immigrants, as well as Americans and people on the street, home breakings, things like this, these have become very serious because they were not carefully vetted the way our law requires. So we then have to say, in terms of your, your question is, how much do we do this? We have an obligation to, uh, to help where we can, but we also have to be able to offer help without it taking the food and shelter away from other poor people. This isn't just inconveniencing the wealthy. It is typically the poor and the lower classes who are losing jobs as well to people who accept lower wages. And so, the, so they get hired for jobs that Americans might have done. There's some of that going on, as well as the endangerment by uh, very serious gang criminal elements. And we have to be careful not to endanger a lot of other people's lives because we don't maintain the proper control of our own borders. And this is something that is not wise at all. It's extraordinarily foolish and a, a better approach has to be taken by our government authorities in regard to that issue. And they, for instance, they never said at the beginning of this crisis, how many people can we actually handle? What is the increase of population we can take care of? And so you have uh, uh, just about 300,000 children who came over the border and nobody knows where they are. And I agree with many others that they are being trafficked. That's horrendous. The government is responsible for that. And that is irresponsible on the part of the government to allow these kids to come in here in order to be trafficked mostly for sexual purposes, maybe other labor, but mostly sexual purposes in this country. This is something that must be addressed. We got rid of slavery officially back in 1865 and 66 when they made the constitutional amendment on that. We need to be more vigilant to stop a recurrence of sex slavery going on. These are serious issues. And I don't see people addressing that in the government. We have to demand that they start taking care of that. So, so there's responsible welcoming of criminals, not of, excuse me, of immigrants, and not giving permission to criminals. This is something that has to be dealt with. All right, we'll take a break. We'll come back with some more of your emails, so please stay with us. Welcome back. We are doing a program where we're trying to answer your uh, email questions that we just don't get a chance to answer on the regular program. So uh, again, remember, you can send your questions and comments by email, writing to scriptureandtradition at ewtn.com. 
So we have here an email from Giuseppe in Alabama. It says, Hi, Father Mitch. My understanding is that in heaven there are no sacraments. To what extent then will heaven resemble Holy Communion? Uh, Giuseppe. Um, one of the ways in which it will not merely resemble uh, Holy Communion, Holy Communion resembles heaven. That, that receiving the sacraments here on earth is a foretaste of the feast in heaven. We will see God face to face. That's why we don't need sacraments that mediate that direct experience of God, but rather it will be a direct communion with God uh, uh, and, and our own souls. So this will be uh, the, the model that heaven is just looking, uh, that, that heaven completes. Heaven is the main uh, example of this. We just have a type that looking forward to it. It's true communion with God, but it is sacramental dealing with our human bodies. There we will see God. Uh, St. Paul describes it. Uh, here we see God darkly as in a mirror. And in his days, mirrors were not made out of glass, but out of metal. So they were sort of hazy. Um, but he said, but we will then uh, see face to face. That would, uh, that's in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And that would be the model for us to understand uh, the, the deeper communion that goes on in heaven. We look forward to that. I have an email from Gavin, and he, it's a little bit long, I'll, I'll read it. Uh, Father Mitch, I've had conversations about the Bible where people say Protestants removed books from the Bible during the Reformation. But isn't that as misleading as saying Catholics added books to the Bible at the Council of Trent. Both statements assume a fixed Old Testament canon prior to the 16th century, which these traditions then either subtracted from or added to. But there was no fixed settled Old Testament canon in the early or medieval church. Disputes endured, including among leading Catholic theologians, and including after the Council of Florence, for instance, Cardinal Jimenez and Cardinal Cajetan, even where the deuterocanonical books are included within the canon, they are often given a subordinate status. That is, many church fathers saw them as a second tier scripture. Even the Catholic Encyclopedia says in the Latin church all through the Middle Ages, we find evidence of hesitation about the character of the deuterocanonicals. Just looking for an honest discussion. Gavin. Well, Gavin, you know, there are a couple points to keep in mind. First, the Septuagint, but I'll use, explain that word. The Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. And this was known by and used by all of the New Testament writers. When they quoted scripture, for the most part, with a few exceptions, um, when they quoted scripture, they quoted from that translation. Um, in fact, there is even a book showing comparisons of the Greek text of the New Testament with the Greek text of the Septuagint, uh, because the, old, the New Testament quotes the Old Testament 360 times. Of those 360 times, 300 are direct 
quotations from the Septuagint, that is, the Greek Old Testament. This was a Greek translation of Jewish, the, the Jewish Bible uh, that was started in 250 B.C. and continued all the way down to perhaps as late as 50 B.C. And various Jewish as well as Christian writers uh, considered this to be an inspired translation. Philo, who was a Jewish, the leading Jewish scholar in Alexandria in the first century, considered it inspired. And obviously, the New Testament writers did as well, because they quote it at least 300 times. Now, when the issue of the canon, yeah, there, there were discussions among various scholars, including St. Jerome. There were a variety of scholars uh, and fathers of the church who expressed concern not only about the uh, deuterocanonical books, that is the seven books that are no longer in the Protestant canon. So yet you see that. However, there are two things that we keep in mind. When the canon was discussed for decisions, of course, the New Testament canon was a, a key issue, but also the Old Testament canon. And you see in the canon of Scripture, the list of the books of the Bible, that are, it was done at the Synod of Rome in, I think it was 365, uh, that this canon includes all of the deuterocanonical books. And even though St. Jerome had his questions and doubts, he accepted what the council taught. This decision was repeated in 392 at the Synod of Hippo and again at the Synod of Carthage in 397. Each of these synods agreed with it. And you mention in 1436 and 37 the Council of Florence. This was a council that uh, as the Turks were getting close to conquering Constantinople, the emperor of Constantinople and the Pope of Rome met in council with the patriarch of Constantinople and Eastern bishops. And they, worked, and they came to an agreement on unification between the two churches after there had been this long schism. In that, they addressed the question of the canon, and they included all the deuterocanonical Bibles. When you take a look at the ancient manuscripts of the Bible, the ancient copies of the Bible, you always find that the Bibles included those seven books. The oldest copy we have of an entire Christian Bible is at the Vatican, Codex Vaticanus Beta. And then you also have Codex Alexandrinus and Sinaiticus. These are complete copies of the Bible from the 300s AD. And all of those copies have those books. So you are, uh, I, I don't know, you might be able to find some, Gavin, but I don't know of any of the codices, that is, complete Bible, the book forms of the Bible, that omitted those books. They were there. They were taken out by Luther. And remember this, Gavin, 
not only did he take those out, but he also removed for a few years seven books from the New Testament. For instance, he removed James and it stayed out for a while. He did not like James because James says in James 2, 24, you are not justified by faith alone. Luther taught that you are justified by faith alone. The epistle of James contradicted it, so he removed it. Now, that's, that's not how you do doctrine, by removing something. And he also removed the second letter of Peter, second John, third John, Jude, Revelation, and I think Hebrews as well. Now, again, in the New Testament church, uh, not New Testament church, but in the uh, third century church and second century, you see there are disputes, partly because not all of the churches had all of the books. So that was uh, very much a dispute. But it was decided, again, at the Synod of Rome in 365, Hippo, and Carthage in the 390s and at uh, Florence. And so, and Luther did put those back in, including James, though he called it an epistle of straw written by some Jew. Well, actually, most of the books except for Luke and Acts were written by Jews. So that applies to the whole Bible. Um, not a very sensible criticism. So this is something that we very much have to deal with. And I think, um, you know, take a look at the manuscripts and see, uh, do you have early manuscripts of the scriptures that omit the deuterocanonical books? I, I, maybe there are some, but they, they aren't there because the councils had decided and from the Synod of Rome Hippo and Carthage onwards, the canon was pretty well set. The other thing too is these books were read in the liturgies. They were included in the lectionaries of all the churches until Luther took them out. So that's not acceptable. Even the first edition of the King James Bible included them, uh, but they took them out in 1627, one of the printing houses was uh, Puritan, and so they removed it. But when King James ordered that translation, they were included. All right, let's now go to Vicki from Combined Locks, Wisconsin. Now, this is not a Jewish delicatessen, not that kind of locks. Uh, there's on, locks on a river. Um, Dear Father Mitch, I read the Bible daily and have many questions. Why did God's, God reject Cain's offering, the first fruits of the ground he worked? Was it because of the curse God placed on Adam, Cain's father? Why did God reject Cain's offering and not Abel's? Vicky from Combined Locks. Um, Vicky, keep very clearly in mind um, the reason for the rejection is not stated. It's simply not said. And I think it does us no good to speculate on why. Um, there are all kinds of things we could uh, consider, but for the most part, if we try to consider what that might be, then what we end up doing is probably projecting what might be wrong with our own offerings to God rather than anything about Cain. We just simply cannot know. It just said that his was rejected. People have come up with all sorts of things. Well, maybe God likes shepherding better than farming. No, I don't. That's just not the case. Uh, of course, God encourages farming and such. Um, but we just don't see the reasons why. It's unknown. So I leave it as something uh, that since the 
the text did not think it necessary to mention what made it unworthy. I'm not going to speculate, but what the Lord says to him next is simply, you know, says, don't look with jealousy on your brother. You simply do what is good and you will do well. That's all the Lord says to him. And a lot of times, you know, we might think, well, you know, this isn't uh, fair. Uh, God hasn't given me the same kind of breaks that he's given other people. And he favors them more than he favors me. And so I'm, I'm going to get back at those people. I think something like that attitude may well have been going on in Cain. And we have to pay attention. There are people who are smarter than we, handsomer, stronger, wealthier, better breaks and opportunities and all sorts of things. But I usually end up doing worse by focusing on trying to bring them down than I would do if I obeyed what God said to Cain, simply do well and you will be fine. Uh, that's a good lesson for all of us to pick up. And Cain didn't. And we see what a mess it caused for him and his descendants. All right, we'll take a break and come back in just a couple of minutes. So please stay with us. Welcome back. Let's get right back to your emails. As we like to say it on here, let's get froggy and jump right in. Uh, we have another email from here in Birmingham. Hello, Father Mitch. A traditional definition, Christian definition of love is that to love someone means to will their good. I'm not sure how to square this up when applying it to God, who is goodness himself. What does it mean to love a God who lacks for nothing? Well, one of the points that I, I think would be key here is that you're right. God lacks nothing at all. It's just uh, uh, simply a gift of his goodness to us that we then accept gratefully. So it, it doesn't mean that we increase God's goodness because any good that we do, such as loving, is itself a gift from God himself. So we're not adding to it, but we're, uh, it's more the way, uh, quite a bit the way, when parents have a newborn baby, that child really doesn't do anything for his parents. But when the child is looking at them and is, shows interest in them, and then when the baby gets a little, a few weeks older, and the baby starts to smile, Parents will do, and grandparents, aunts and uncles, and any other adult in the uh, decent adult in the vicinity, will try to get that baby to smile at them. Now, does that smile make their day better? Yes. But does it make it better because the smile does something for that adult? 
Does it, it improve the wealth or health of a grandparent when a baby smiles? No, but it brings great joy to them when their grandchild smiles at them and they'll take that with them. And same for the parents, when their baby just smiles at them, they are just smiling ear to ear with that. It's a great delight for them to take delight in their child and when he takes delight back in them. This is about as much as we can do for God, but he cherishes it as much as any parent cherishes the look uh, and smile of a happy little baby. And this is all that God wants, is recognition of how much he loves us and praising him for it, okay? We also have another email. This one is from Jason who writes, Hi, Father Mitch. In Matthew 22, verse 30, it says, They neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like the angels in heaven. What is our relationship with our spouse and children in heaven then? If marriage is one of the sacraments and considered a vocation here on earth, it would make sense to me there is some form of that relationship continuing in heaven. Jason, there is. As a matter of fact, one of the things I will uh, guarantee is that if you and your spouse and your children are in heaven, you will love each other far more than you loved each other here on earth. But there is something that we need to consider. First, in heaven, there is neither marrying nor giving in marriage. Why? There is no procreation in heaven. There is therefore no need to increase souls by an exclusive relationship that procreates new individuals. So that's why there's no need for heaven. And this gets at that primary good of matrimony, which is the uh, birth of children. And that's just unnecessary. But you will know each other and be known by each other more profoundly than you were on earth. And you will have another level of understanding of your spouse than what you had here on earth. At the same time, it won't be exclusive. Other people will know and love you and in ways that you just couldn't imagine. And it will be a joy to be in each other's presence, a joy that's deeper than any joy you could have had here on earth. It won't be simply a continuation of earthly existence, something much deeper. But neither will it be a continuation on earth of exclusivity. This is where we belong to Christ and all of us will be focused on God and at the same time loving our neighbor as ourselves, but without, you know, as much hidden from us. There'll be a deeper understanding and cherishing of who each person is. That will be key in heaven and that's something very much to look forward to. And then from Dennis, I have an interesting question, a good one. Father Mitch, during the Mass, what is the reason for putting a piece of the host into the chalice after the consecration? Very important. When the priest consecrates the bread, he does that first, and then he consecrates the wine, 
and becomes the body of Christ for the, in the case of the bread and the blood of Christ in the case of the wine. But notice, we consecrate each of them separately. That is a sign of Christ's death. It, that's why that moment of the consecration at Mass is the representation of Christ's death on the cross when his body and blood are separate. And this is a key component of understanding Mass. However, Mass is also a sacrament of the resurrection. And in that resurrection, we see that symbolized when the priest breaks the host and breaks a fragment of the host and places it into the chalice. This is in all of the rites. It's not just the Roman rite. It's in all the rites because that symbolizes the resurrection. That's why the priest raises it up. And it's a sign of the resurrection. And so we have uh, the, the, the death of Christ and the resurrection of Christ so that when we bring our offerings to Mass, we unite them with the bread and wine so they can be joined with Christ on the cross. But we also receive Holy Communion, which is a sign of the resurrection and that all of the difficulties and pains we have would be changed for us, okay? All right, we have another question from Lisa in Nederland, uh, Texas, uh, right just uh, close to Beaumont. Uh, Dear Father Packwell, what is more important, fighting for what we as Christians believe or loving one another as Jesus loves us? Um, <laughs> well, first of all, it's not mutually exclusive. If you are a parent and someone is trying to uh, kidnap your child from your arms, you are going to fight because you love that child and know that that other person means no good for your child. And this is protecting what is your responsibility and at the same time exercising your true love for your child. So also, we love the faith and we love its integrity and our own integrity in living out the faith. So we will fight for that integrity, not because we simply want to fight. This isn't some television news program where you argue for a living <clears throat> and that that's all you've got is fighting for a living. It's not what we do. We fight for what's true because it's true and we love the truth. And then when, uh, when that's done, then we, we cease. Uh, and, and we seek reconciliation with the people we disagreed with. And we try to avoid the fight ever getting personal, but always do what we can to protect the dignity of the other person and at the same time, the truth about God. That's where we keep balance, not either or. All right, we're out of time. May the Lord bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you and lead you in all of your ways by his peace. Almighty God bless you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. And please remember to keep us in between your gas bill, electric bill, and cable bill. And if you do that, we'll be able to pay all of our bills too. God bless you and thank you. Thank you.